He is risen. He is risen amen. Amen. We have had just a wonderful week here this past week. Every night this week, people have gathered in this room to plead with the King of Kings for the souls of those whom they love and want to see come to faith in Christ. And in between services, I got a text from my wife that somebody we prayed for by name Sunday night came to faith in Christ this morning. So they have been long prayed for, many hours shared with, so don't give up. Never give up on anyone. God is unwilling that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. Amen? Amen. Now, we somewhat tongue-in-cheek this past Friday uh, at noon and evening talked about the fact that, you know, it's kind of a a fumbling greeting that we have for Good Friday. I mean, what do we say? You know, Merry Good Friday, that doesn't make any sense, or Happy Good Friday, and then we talk about the death of Jesus. And we made the point Friday that there is good in Good Friday, but we know exactly what to say today. Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. And having found the good in Good Friday, we recognize through the seven statements of Jesus from the cross that it was pointing forward to what we are celebrating today. And even as Jesus opened up the things he said, when nailed to a tree, he, he started with what is most important to us and what we'll talk about today, and that is his prayer was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And I, I want to give you some hints about our title this morning as we move forward, and I want to see if maybe you can pick up on it before uh, we get there. And, and having made the seven statements on the cross, having breathed his last breath, Matthew tells us that Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now this is important that we recognize it was torn from top to bottom. First of all, the veil in the temple was 18 inches thick. It wasn't a bed sheet. It was woven material. And it was torn from top to bottom because that was God saying, you have complete access to me through Jesus Christ. And the the veil was torn from top to bottom. The earthquake, the rocks were split, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared to many. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly this was the Son of God. Well, that was a true statement, but I do believe it needed a bit of correction. Jesus, we don't say, was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He is seated at the right hand of majesty, yet even today on high. And the truth is, after dying on the cross for the sins of the world, three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And as the Son of God, Jesus was sinless. And therefore, he did not owe the wages of sin, which is. But after the scene we read in Matthew, three days later, the body of Jesus was not where they left it, as we'll see in a moment. On that same day, the tomb was found to be empty. Two of his disciples who had lost hope because of the circumstances that they had witnessed. Jesus had died on the cross. And three days later, they were headed back home to a city known as Emmaus. And Jesus showed up and uh, disguised himself or masked his appearance, I should say. And he asked them, and I'm paraphrasing his question, why the long faces? What are you guys talking about that has made you so sad? Well, in response, the two disciples told Jesus what had happened to Jesus. And how their hopes had been dashed and how they had hoped that he was going to be the long promised Mashiach ben David, the Messiah of Israel. And in response to this, Jesus said to them in Luke 24, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, meaning the first five books of the Bible and the prophetic books, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning who? Himself. Himself. The whole Bible is about Jesus. 
Amen. And earlier, Jesus had breathed his last and he had committed his spirit into the Father's hands. And now three days later, he resumes his teaching ministry with two of his dejected disciples. And our title today, which actually I received uh, during the Passion Week prayer on Tuesday night. And by the way, if you ever see me in church on my phone, I'm not texting. I'm just old enough that when I believe God's speaking to me, I better write it down. And I got the whole message on Tuesday night, including the title, which I've dropped three hints for. And it starts with the word three. And our title today is Three Days Later. And we're going to find the whole meaning of the Good Friday Easter sequence of events that uh, we celebrate today and commemorate today. And on Friday, Jesus said, it is finished. In other words, what he came to do on mankind's behalf had been accomplished. And after he breathed his last, three days later, the statement of the centurion was proven without question that he truly is the Son of God. And in Luke 24, 1 to 7, we're told on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, very early in the morning, and let me just pause there for a moment. A lot of people say the church uh, has violated the law by meeting not on Shabbat or not on Saturday, but meeting on Sunday. Well, let me just say this. The church has always met on Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Amen. And we are Christians, we are not under the law. Amen. The law was given to the Jews. Yeah. We are in the age of grace. Yeah. And the church has never met on Saturday. The church has always met on Sunday because the Lord has done a new thing and there's a new covenant that we are under. Amen. And we're told very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices, the, the burial spices, which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened that they were greatly perplexed about this. That two, uh, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. And then the angel said, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? And the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again? And you know, I've often made the point that women were the last at the cross and the first to the tomb. But before the women get all puffy, <laughs> they were at the tomb for the wrong reason. They should have been at the tomb to see that it was empty not to bring burial spices. And where were the disciples? They'd been told that he was gonna rise in three days, yet none of them were there. So there's still kudos to the women. <laughs> there's a lot of female yes and amen there, I'm not sure why. But these and other familiar Easter verses are wonderful to consider at face value. And they record the day that divided time, proved Jesus' claims, emptied the place known as Abraham's bosom, and made it possible then for Paul to write this in 2 Corinthians 5, 8, that we are confident, yes, well pleased, to be rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see, before the resurrection of Jesus, this could not be said, because he had to be the firstborn among many brethren. He had to be the first to die, live again, and stay alive forever. And that means he had to be the way maker. And he had to do the things that he was uh, commissioned to do when he came into this earth to die for the sins of the whole world, including die, three days later, resurrect, 40 days later, ascend into heaven. So this Easter Sunday morning, I wanna draw your attention to three of the ripples in the water, so to speak, meaning the results of what happened after Jesus died on the cross. After all, that's why you're here, right? You didn't come here to hear a speech, did you? <laughs> funny stories? Nope. I, I know some funny stories. I thought about starting with one uh, this morning, but it had nothing to do with the Bible, so I skipped it. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's ask the Lord's blessing on our time. Father, we are so grateful to know that Jesus is alive, and therefore we too can live and live forever. We thank you for these wonderful words. Lord, not often uh, visited, at least not often enough uh, throughout the year, but always on Easter Sunday, we consider the things that we'll hear this morning, but we thank you that they're true every day. So Lord, help us to see them with more clarity than ever before. And I pray, should there be any here today who do not know you, 
And by the end of our time together, they would be your child. We ask this in Jesus' name and all in agreement said, Amen. Amen. Now, one thing I think it's important for us to remember historically is that Satan had been trying to kill the Messiah for over a thousand years. And this stems from the fact that Genesis 3.15, after Eve was deceived and Adam consciously sinned, the Lord said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And Satan understood at least to a degree what this meant. He understood that this woman represented Israel and the seed in her represented a supernaturally conceived male Hebrew child. And this is why Pharaoh sought to kill all the Hebrew boys at their birth. As Exodus 1, 15 and 16 says, when the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of whom the name of one was Shifra and the other was Pua, and he said, when you do the duties of the midwife for the Hebrew woman, Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools. If it is a son, then you shall what? Kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Now, why would Satan go after only the Hebrew boys? Because he knew God chose Israel. And listen, God has not cast off Israel. Hello? The church has not replaced Israel. Modern Israel is biblical Israel. And listen this morning, let me say it loud and clear. Are you ready? No Christian should be saying from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. There is no Palestine. It is a nation of Israel. It is a land that God gave to them by eternal covenant. And that covenant was unconditional and eternal. Now, Satan tried again with Herod and the Jewish boys under two in Matthew 2.16 we're told that Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. Herod was trying to convince the wise men, but they were wise men. That, yeah, I need to know where he is so I can go worship him too, when his effort was really to try and kill the Messiah under satanic inspiration. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all districts. Where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem. And from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. Now, I have to say, after these failed attempts, when Jesus breathed his last, Satan must assuredly thought, I got him. I finally got him. Well, the truth was, three days later, Jesus was alive and death was defeated. Three days later, Jesus was alive and death was defeated. And I don't think it's speculation to say that Satan thought he finally won when Jesus breathed his last. After all, think about this. If he knew Jesus was going to rise from the dead, if he knew Jesus' resurrection would empty Abraham's bosom, if he knew Jesus' resurrection would call all believers who from that point on become absent from the body to be present with the Lord, do you think he would have killed him? No, he was expecting a completely different outcome, which was finality of this millennia old battle, a millennia long old battle. Now Satan thought he'd won, but three days later, early in the morning on the first day of the week, Jesus was alive and the sting of death was defeated. Yeah. Now, some may think, okay, yeah, I hear you, but uh, if death was defeated, then why do people still die? Because the death question is what Satan twisted to deceive Eve all the way back in the garden. We're told in Genesis about a serpent who was more cunning than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you know, God is always right. He's God and you're not. Is that what he said? No, he said, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, let me ask you a question. Did Adam and Eve fall down dead when they ate of the forbidden fruit? No, but they did die instantly spiritually and their relationship and fellowship with God was severed. That's why the Bible tells us we need to be born again. We're born spiritually dead. We're born not in the fullness of the image and similitude of God that was enjoyed initially by man, but we are born in a condition 
of being lacking of spiritual life within us. Now that's why I, I've never met a parent who teaches their child to lie. Have you? But man, those little liars will lie with chocolate <laughs> all over their face and deny they ate a cookie, won't they? Why? Because they have a sin nature. And they don't become sinners when they first, uh, sin for the first time. They prove they're sinners by sinning, just like the rest of us. But the, the death that is in view here is the second death. And that's why John was told in Revelation chapter 20, uh, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection over such the second death has no power. And this is the death that we need to avoid at all costs. Yeah. And Jesus, after he proved that he was alive for 40 days with many people having seen him, having appeared to Mary, then the disciples, and then over 500 people in one sitting, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the question I think we all have to ask is have we made the decision for the afterlife that is with fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore that King David wrote of in Psalm 1611? Or have we chosen through our decision concerning the Christ, whether he's alive or not, or whether he's the God, uh, son of God or not, have we chosen separation from God and an eternity in the lake of fire? And listen, it's not real popular today to talk about hell. I got news for you. It never has been. Nobody wants to hear about it. But it, it, is it a biblical doctrine? Hell is not a description of the state of being without Christ. It is a place of eternal punishment. But what we need to understand is that we are all born headed there and God has made a way through his son that no one need go there. And that's the fairness of God. That's the justice of God. He couldn't just turn a blind eye away from our sin. He had to do something about it. And he did. He sent Jesus to the cross. And that's why the Bible says Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And he died for your sins and mine. Not sure what the hesitation was there, but we need to be thankful for that. That's what we're here today to do, to celebrate what God has done for us. Yes. And we can live in a, in a place and, and a life that's nothing like this. But listen, the devil thought he had Jesus when he gave up the ghost, as, as Scripture says, on the tree. But it was obvious that it wasn't the Jesus who uh, had had it. Satan had, because Jesus is alive. And his great threat of death was lessened, and we need not fear the second death. Now, some might ask today, and they do, oh, come on, how do you know? Have you seen him? No, not yet, but I'm going to. But I know what it feels like to have your sin forgiven. And let me let you in on something else. I know, as of last Sunday night, what it feels like to be healed. I'd had something going on that I'd never told anybody except for my wife. And years ago when I was drinking whiskey every day out of a bottle, I found myself with an ulcer. And I think I had another one. I was drinking my Lanta every day, all day, every day, just to deal with it. And one of the ladies last night in the midst of the prayer time decided to pray for me. And she prayed for my healing. And I felt God heal me right in this room. Amen. I felt something in my abdomen heal up. And that was last Sunday night. And I'm not kidding, no exaggeration. I've been drinking my Lanta all day, every day, just to cope with it. Haven't had any since. Amen. This is God. And the fact is, we serve a God who heals, but I think the greatest thing we need to focus on, that it's not just our physical maladies that he heals, he heals our eternal destinies of separation apart from him. He reconciles us to the Father. He gives us that, that confidence, that uh, guaranteed down payment in ourselves of the Holy Spirit, and we can know that we're his. We can know that we are his child. And he proved his ability and authority to do this by rising from the dead. And you know, every other religious leader in the world who claims to know and have access to the place called heaven or paradise or whatever they're going to call it, is still in their grave. But Jesus' tomb is empty. Because three days later, 
He rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. Amen. Now, listen, there's some other things I think we need to consider. And that is, uh, why do you believe that? You haven't seen him. I have experienced his powerful touch, and many of you have as well. Amen. Amen. Someday we're going to see him. 1 John 3, 2 says, and when we see him, we'll be like him. For we'll see him as he is, meaning we will be eternal. But here's something I think we need to highlight this morning. Listen, if a book can tell me 2,000 years ago, and sometimes as much as 3,000 years ago, what's going to happen in the future, and then it happens exactly as written, then I'm going to have confidence in all the other things that are in it that I haven't seen yet. Someday I am going to see Jesus. Right now I can see Israel as a nation again after being scattered among the nations for almost 2,000 years. I can see the coalition of nations, the Bible said, that is going to form against the nation of Israel and be drugged down from the north and invade Israel in cooperation together. And this was written some 2,700 years ago or 2,600 years ago. And that's Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, and Sudan are going to invade Israel and God is going to deal with them directly. The Bible said almost 2,000 years ago in the last days that people would be lovers of themselves. Are they? Are people lovers of themselves today? Well, what goes with that as a companion is that they're haters of God. And one of the things that often gets overlooked regarding the last day scenario is in Isaiah chapter 2 through chapter 5, we're told twice in chapter 2 what's going to happen at the time that the Lord arises to shake the earth, which is descriptive of the tribulation period. And one of the things that Isaiah wrote 2,700 years ago is that at that time the world would be plagued with incompetent leaders. He said, I will give them children for their princes. Princes can mean rulers. Are we plagued with incompetent leadership today? All over the world. Do you know what's going on in Canada? In Canada, Trudeau has made it where people can't watch the news. Their phones are locked out from news stations. They can't see any news coming out of the United States. They can't see it at all. Uh, they have made it up in Canada, and, and our country is not doing any better, illegal to pray out loud or read the Bible out loud because it's under the hate speech law as determined as criminal. This is what's happening in our world. You know, I always looked at Isaiah 2 through 5 as being figurative, this I'll give them children for their princes, but I think there's a literal component of that too. After all, there's some high school girl who's telling the world about climate change. And how many degrees does she have in climatology? Yeah. Uh, that'd be zero. She wasn't even out of high school when this whole thing started, yet everybody bows down to her as though she's some, she shows up at the World Economic F uh, Forum yeah. where kings and princes and world leaders are, and there's some kid there telling everybody, how dare you destroy the planet? <laughs> and all this other nonsensical stuff. And not only that, on top of that, are children telling parents what gender they are? Yeah, we have children for rulers today in a lot of cases. The Bible said that a time would come when much of the church would not put up a sound doctrine. And this just this past week, a well-known church in our country, a very popular church, a very well-attended church, their content director announced that in the Easter invitations that were mailed out to the people in their city, that, and I quote, the church avoids using language that immediately makes someone feel like an outsider, particularly for an event like Easter Sunday. When I think about how I'm going to talk about Easter, this person went on to say, I'm thinking about how I'm going to talk to people far from God because that's the thing that matters most to us. For the most important thing on Easter is inviting people to church. No, the most important thing on Easter is that Jesus is alive. That's the most important thing. Now listen, listen to what this very popular, well-attended church said. This means reaching people far from God, so we're not going to use words like Calvary, resurrection, or the phrase, the blood of Jesus. We will not use language that will immediately make someone feel like an outsider. 
Well, Calvary is doctrinal. Resurrection is doctrinal. The blood of Jesus is doctrinal. And this church will not put up with sound doctrine. Is Jesus coming soon? Yes. Absolutely. And we could keep going with other examples, but let me say this. Since I can see all that, I have ample evidence to believe this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Hebrews 4.14 says, who passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Is Jesus God's Son? Yes. The Bible says He is. All the rest of it's true. That must be too. Hebrews 8.1 says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. And I don't know, maybe it's overly obvious, but in order for Jesus to be seated at the right hand of our majestic father, doesn't he have to be alive? Yes. Well, then he rose from the dead yes. and he ascended into heaven, which he did in front of eyewitnesses. And if he is alive, that means he did conquer death. Yes. And if he did conquer death, that means that his claim to be the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to heaven is proven and trustworthy. And listen, Good Friday is called that because of Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is alive. Amen. And John 10, 8, Jesus reminded us of this, where he said, or 10, 18 rather, no one takes it from me, speaking of his life, but I lay it down on myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again, which is a power exclusive to God. This command I received from my father. Remember, Jesus often talked about uh, his relationship with his father from his humanity. But he also said, Lord, restore me that glory that I had with you before the world began. So he was glory, uh, equal in glory to the Father, quite clearly. Now, did Jesus lay down his life for us? Yes. Did three days later he take it up again? Yes. He did. In John 19, 30, we're told when Jesus had received the sour wine, having said, I thirst, he then said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Now, the last statement of Jesus before his death was, it is finished. Then three days later, the Bible was proven to be divinely inspired. Three days later, the Bible was proven to be divinely inspired. The resurrection of Christ refutes all other claims of a means to obtain eternal life and proves the Bible to be true. Yes. Uh, there must be a delay in the microphone out there. <laughs> now... Matthew tells us in, in chapter 12 that some of the scribes and Pharisees said to Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of what? Fish. Are whales fish? Nope. No, whales are mammals, right? I don't know where this whole Jonah and the whale thing came up. I guess it's just a size issue. But the Bible says God prepared a great fish. He can do that, you know. Amen. <laughs> if he can create all the universes in six nightday cycles, he can certainly make a fish that can house a man for three days and three nights. Amen. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. John 2, 18 to 22. We're told that Jesus answered and said, What sign do you show us uh, since you do these things? And Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in... Three days, I will raise it up. And the Jews said, yeah, listen, it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you'll raise it back up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of what? His body. his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus said. And what happened after this? He was in the heart of the earth for three days, just like Jonah was inside a great divinely prepared fish for three days. Later, he was risen from the dead, three days to be exact. And the scriptures prove their divine inspiration indisputably. Now listen this morning, I suppose somebody could say, and, and a lot of those who follow after the evolutionary, the march from molecules to man theory, that given enough time, anything could happen. And you know, if somebody were to say something 2,700 years ago, something was bound to come along at some point in the future that could be called fulfillment of what was previously said. Oh, Siri, go away. <laughs> My iPad is, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Oh, shut up, I'm not talking to you. Now, 
The interesting thing that some may make that argument that, you know, time and chance can cause anything to happen. But what if somebody says something about what's going to happen three days from now? And then it happens exactly. You have to eliminate time and chance then. Or maybe three weeks in advance or three months in advance. Jesus did that kind of thing all the time. And the truth about our proposition is that it didn't happen that way. And it wasn't just happenstance. And what the Bible prophesied was not some vague Nostradamus type prediction. As a matter of fact, the Bible said the manner of birth, uh, the birth of Jesus was stated specifically in Isaiah 7, 14. He'd be born of a virgin. The city of his birth was named directly Bethlehem in Micah 5, 2. The circumstances of his birth were described exactly in Isaiah 53, that he would be of lowly means. He wasn't born like a king in a golden uh, uh, bassinet or any of those things. He was born in a stable and laid in a feeding trough. The means and details of his beating, death, and resurrection weren't simply hazy implications or implied possibilities. They were clear and concise descriptions given anywhere from 700 to 1,000 years before they happened, and they happened exactly as written, including Psalm 1610. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. David wrote this in 1,000 B.C. or thereabouts. And the word from the Hebrew that is translated as corruption means uh, it's the same word used for the decomposition of a body, which begins after four days. How long was Jesus in the grave? Three, Three days. So was this scripture fulfilled? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think about, you know, remember Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus died and Jesus said, he'll live again. And he went and said, open up the tomb. You remember what they said? Don't do it, man. It's been four days and he stinks. Well, because his body would have begun uh, uh, decomposition at that point in time. But the Bible said, a thousand years before it happened, that the Holy One would not see decomposition or corruption of the body. Now, maybe you're thinking here today. Is anybody thinking here today? <laughs> maybe you're thinking, okay, you're trying to elevate the Bible above other books because of the re resurrection, and that's kind of a stretch. No, it's not a stretch at all. After all, John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? God. Well, just in case you're wondering who the Word is, John 1, 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, uh, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Who's the only begotten of the Father? Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. Amen. John is told in Revelation 19 to worship God. For the testimony, the witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And listen, the Bible connects Jesus and the written word over and over and over. And for all the reasons we just stated, he is the word. And therefore, what happens to him? The word is being confirmed by that. And it might seem for us, maybe, you know, that's a little hard uh, to believe. But you know what? There's a lot of hard to believe things in the Bible that happen just as the Bible said they would. I mean, uh, born of a virgin? You know, people aren't going to jump on that bandwagon right away in the natural. Was Jesus born of a virgin? Yes. Absolutely. That was prophesied all the way back in Genesis 3.15, what's called the Proto-Evangelicum, the first preaching of the gospel, and, and that a, a, a woman's seed, and we know in the reproductive process, the woman doesn't bear the seed, the man does. The woman is representative both of Israel and the supernatural conception. Jesus was born of the Holy Spirit, and there was a woman who housed his body as it developed, and he was born in humble means, and the Bible foretold all of these things. Jesus died on the cross, and three days later, he rose from the dead. And therefore, death was defeated, and the divine inspiration and the infallibility of the Bible was proven. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now, we're told in Matthew 27 that the day after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, how that deceiver, they're calling Jesus a deceiver, said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard, go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Well, yes, Jesus was in a tomb. 
and he borrowed it from a man named Joseph of Arimathea. And I say he borrowed it from him because Jesus was only going to need it for the weekend. Because early in the morning on the first day of the week, he would arise. Amen? Amen. And the chief priests and Pharisees who called for the death of Jesus knew what he said about rising again three days later. So they thought that they could seal the king of kings with a wax seal around a stone and keep him in there and no one could take him out. And I think it's proper that we say, you know, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. The stone was rolled away to let us in so we could see that the tomb is empty. He was laid in a tomb, and three days later, this happened in spite of the tomb being sealed and Roman soldiers guarding it, where Matthew 28 tells us that after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, that's Sunday, amen? Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning. Man, it's going to be cool to see angels, isn't it? And his clothing, you know, you could say it's, it's cool about something heavenly, right? Because yes. it's going to be cool to see angels. Yes. And his clothing is white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. In other words, these brave Roman guards passed out when they saw an angel. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. And he said, come see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. Isn't that an interesting mixture? I mean, you just saw a heavenly being that caused grown men to fall on the ground and pass out. And then he starts talking to you. And then he starts telling you something that is through normal channels, completely impossible, but we're dealing with the supernatural here. And then you're given a command to go tell the rest what you have seen. And we know that on the same day, Jesus encountered these two dejected disciples we talked about a moment ago. And this conversation and that conversation had hopelessness turned into joy, just as with the two Marys at the tomb. You see, that's what today is all about. Today is about turning from the things that hold us, the things that cause fear in us, the things that cause doubt in us to the true and living God and having a bold confidence in what we have believed being true. Jesus is alive. Now, what that tells us is that after Jesus gave up his spirit, three days later, a message of hope was sent out to the world. And this is the gospel of Christ. And after the resurrection, what you'll find is a phrase repeatedly uh, employed, and that is go and tell, go and tell, go and tell, go and tell, go and tell what? Go and tell Jesus is alive. And that's what we're supposed to do today. Go and tell that, uh, that Jesus is not in the tomb any longer, that he is now alive. And by the way, Jesus is not in the manger, and he's not on the cross. And the crucifix is something that uh, gives an entirely wrong message because Jesus was on the cross for a matter of hours, but then he was taken down from the cross and put in a tomb. And then early in the morning on the first day of the week, he was out of the tomb, and now he's seated at the right hand of majesty on high. We don't know what the throne room looks like other than the physical description uh, that we have in in the book of Revelation. But I'll tell you one thing, he's not on the cross anymore. He finished the work that he came to do. And thus, after all of this, he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, what is the gospel? What what exactly does that word mean? And we often hear it defined as what? Good news, right? Well, what the word actually means is the good message. Go into all the world and preach the good message. And the good message is this, and John the Beloved records it, I believe, in 1 John 2. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. There's the good message. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, let me ask this question, since people are so concerned about uh, Christians using words that 
make other people feel like outsiders. How many of you use the word propitiation this week? <laughs> I don't think anybody threw that out there, right? But we're not scared of it here. Nope. Amen? Amen? Because what the word means is atonement. It's been described as debt satisfaction. Jesus is the debt satisfaction for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the whole world. After all, what debt is being referred to? The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. But I'm thankful Paul kept writing, aren't you? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And listen, Jesus paid the wages of sin for the whole world in his own blood. And in order for that to become someone's personal reality, the requirement on our end in order to receive the gift of God is Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In 1 John 1, 9, in that famed passage, if, condition, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from some unrighteousness. No, all unrighteousness. Twice we're told the portion that we uh, must practice, I don't want to say contribute because we contribute nothing to our salvation, is simply to confess that we are sinners. Now the word confess means to see is the same. And let me say something here, and I believe this needs to be heard uh, by some in the room, maybe some online. But part of confessing our sins is to agree with God's definitions of sin. You can't have a solid bar approach to what sin is. You may think something ought not to be sinful, but you're not God. So your input is irrelevant. You may think that two people of the same sex ought to be having a loving relationship, but God said, no, that's not my design. You may not like that, but let me say this as delicately, delicately as I can, too bad. It doesn't matter. God has no suggestion box. You may think this or that ought to be different than it is, but confessing your sin means to see as or speak of as the same. The word could also be translated as to agree with. You could even translate the Greek word translated as confess as to concede. And we need to concede that we are sinners. And that Christ is the only Savior and alive forevermore. Aren't you glad it's just that simple? It's not complex at all. There's no religious hoops for us to jump through. No rituals for us to constantly practice to stay saved. But instead of a life bound by sin and its consequences, we have this from John 8, 36. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be what? free indeed. You know, I find it uh, sadly humorous. How many people see Christianity as being in bondage? And you know, people in bondage are the ones who see it that way. And the ones who are bound by sinful practices. And listen, I've lived for myself and it doesn't work out well. I've lived for the enemy. That worked out even worse. Living for God is as free as you're going to get during this life. And many people think, well, you know, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I'm free to believe whatever I choose. Well, that might sound good and even appealing, but what they fail to note is the end result of that is catastrophic. Beside the fact that the freedom we have in Christ is spiritual and it's powerful. And many people who think they're free are actually puppets of the enemy who only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, as John 10.10 10 says. And Jesus follows that with, yeah, he comes to do that. But I've come that they may have life and even have it more abundantly. And he declares himself to be the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Now that's a good message. That we can be made free indeed. So let me ask you, have you responded to it? Have you responded to that message? Or maybe some would say, well, you know, I'm still thinking about it. Well, I have a newsflash for you. You ready for this? There's no better offer coming because there's no better offer. Amen. This is as good as it's going to get. And through Christ, you can exchange perishing for everlasting life. 
And all of this because Jesus breathed his last and gave up his spirit. And three days later, he was alive. And an unparalleled message of hope is now offered to the whole world. Or I might put it like this, if I can borrow a portion of a movie line, he's making you an offer. You should not refuse. Because refusal is costly. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, but he washed me white as snow. What's going to compare to that? There's, there's nothing. And you know, uh, I want to give a, a word of encouragement here uh, because there's pretty high likelihood there may be some prodigals in the room, uh, those who have wandered away. And uh, I think one of the most beautiful stories, the, the, the parables that the Lord shared, was that of the prodigal son. And, you know, he lived for himself and took his inheritance, which legally he was able to demand from his father his inheritance. And he went, and the Bible says he spent it on riotous living. He was living a party life. And, and you know, when he finally came to the end of himself and he was eating at a pig trough, he said, you know what? Things are better at dad's house. You know, even the servants eat better than I'm eating right now. So he went home, and, and my favorite part of that story is that when he was still a far way off, the father saw him and he ran to meet him. You know why? Because that was the hardest part of the journey. Here he blew his inheritance on living for himself, and what was going to be the most difficult in the story is when he came within eye shot of the father's house. Can you imagine in, in that type of scene, pacing back and forth? You know what it's like when you owe somebody an apology? And you see them, and you know you got to make things right? What's the hard part? Walking up and saying, I blew it. I'm sorry. Well, the same was true for him. So what did the father do? He ran to get his prodigal son through the hardest part and bring him home. And listen, if you're a prodigal, and, and you know most of you know at least a portion of my story, um, it was funny because I shared my story one time and it went out uh, over the radio and some guy commented and said, you know, every Calvary pastor got drunk one time in high school and thought they were a prodigal. Well, no, I didn't get drunk. I got drunk for the first time in high school. I stayed drunk for 10 years. So it wasn't just, you know, oh, I goof, so now I've got a prodigal story. When I was in high school, my best friend dad died. <clears throat> and this is all during the, the hippie movement, you know, and I got radically saved when I was 12. And, you know, I shared the Lord, drug people to church, even if they didn't want to go, and yeah. wanted to see my friends come to Christ. And then this happened when we were 16. His mom's solution to knowing where all four of her teenage kids were was to stock the beer, or stock the fridge with beer. And so that's where I had my first drink. I took my first drink at 16, next thing I know I was 26. My wife had left me. I missed my daughter's second birthday, which still torments me and my memories. And I was raised under the belief that <clears throat> if you lost your salvation, you couldn't get it back. And I believe that with all my heart. And many of my drunken and drug-induced stupors, I saw crazy things and believed, completely believed I was demon-possessed. And my wife, while we were separated, God was moving. He heals, Amen. restores years. Amen. The canker worm is eaten. Amen. Amen. And during those years, uh, months, I should say, my wife got saved. She called me. I'm sorry. I called her. She always corrects me when I say she called me. <laughs> she didn't want to talk to me. But I, I'd finally been able to reach her. I couldn't find her for eight months. And she got on the phone and she said, you know, I went to church with my sister and I got saved. And they told me I need to tell people. So I'm telling you, I got saved. We're still getting a divorce, but I got saved. Well, but God, even when, amen? amen. Well, we got back together and God was good and kind to us. And I was still, you know, having my battles and struggles and you know, especially with my salvation, believing I'd lost it. And, you know, when you do that, you try and self-medicate and all those other things. And uh, she had gotten involved in a, um, a home study group with uh, women from another church. It was the Forbidden Church, Calvary Costa Mesa. 
and her little group Bible study leader, they've been praying for me unbeknownst to me, and her little group Bible study leader, her name was Carol, and I don't even think she's five feet tall. But, you know, she came to talk to me, and, you know, Terry was new in the faith, and she was just gobbling up the word. I, I just remember, you know, she's constantly in the word, every day, all day, just studying, 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 reading, so hungry for the word of God. And uh, so Carol came over to talk to me, and I said, Carol, thanks. It's very sweet of you to try, but my goose is cooked. I'm demon-possessed. I've lost my salvation. And this little gal who was not five foot somehow was up in my six-foot-two face. I don't know how she did it. I don't think she levitated, but somehow that's how I saw it. And she got up in my face, and she said, in Jesus' name, come out! <laughs> uh, what, what was that? <laughs> and Carol said very sweetly and calmly, and again, she's just a little tiny thing. She said, there's power in the name of Jesus. And if you had a demon in you, that spirit would have had responded to the authority of Jesus' name. Amen. She said, you're not demon-possessed. You need to go talk to one of the pastors of my church. So I said, okay, I'll go down there. And I went down to Calvary Costa Mesa, and as I was walking through the little quad area there, I see this stocky little guy walking across the, the area, and he says, you look like you're looking for something, which I think was a loaded statement. And I said, yeah, I am. The guy's name was Romaine, by the way, maybe some of you. <laughs> are familiar with him. And you know, it was just such a strange thing to hear the stories about him afterwards because he was so kind to me and so gentle with me and told me I hadn't lost my salvation, I just needed to come home. And that the Father's arms were open and he was awaiting my arrival just to let go of all the things that were so easily besetting me and come back to the Lord, which I did. And we had a wonderful relationship with Romaine uh, after that, and we had a ministry in our house called The Hungry at Home, and he would send food needs to us, and, and just a wonderful man. I, I couldn't believe some of the stories I started to hear. <laughs> and the first of which was, um, there was a guy that came in to see Romaine, and he was whining about how hard life was, how terrible his wife was, and how awful his boss was, and he was just going on and on and on about how hard things were, and Romaine said, hey, follow me a minute, would you? i got to run over here real quick. And So they went through a series of rooms and um, finally got into the nursery. And Romaine reaches into a cabinet, pulls out a diaper, and says to the guy, put this on, you big baby. <laughs> that wasn't how he handled me. <laughs> he was very sweet and very kind, and I appreciated that so much. But, you know... Uh, I, I say that for this reason. You know, I think a lot of times where we're out there running the streets, so to speak, as a prodigal, we think there's no way home. But there is. Jesus made that way. He made that way for the first time recipient of salvation and for the wanderer. And because of him, we can come home. And really, that's what Easter is all about. It's about a resurrection. It's about you know, new life in Christ, becoming a new creation, and old things passed away, and it's about the right to come home when you've wandered and squandered and wasted your life and even hurt others. So I say that because I want to make sure that you know that Resurrection Sunday is about your resurrection too Amen. and the right to come back to the Father's house. And he'll, he'll help you through the hard part. You know, I, it took me, you know, I, some of you know, uh, more details about my story than others, but I've had asthma my whole life, so I took up smoking to cure it. <laughs> and when I came back to the Lord, that stopped right away. I stopped smoking pot, stopped doing other drugs. It took me four years to beat the alcohol. And was I saved? Oh, yes, absolutely. It was a series of fall and get up, fall and get up, fall. Sometimes I go for six months without drinking, and then I'd take off and start again and have some lame excuse. And, uh, you know, finally, you know, in crying out to the Lord, God, help me! In essence, he said, 
I did. You're the one that keeps drinking. <laughs> knock it off. I mean, it was a very definite, heavenly knock it off. There was an implied or else behind it. And that was it. The booze was done. And so I say that to just remind you that God is a God of restoration. God is a God of healing. God is a God of forgiveness. Uh, God is a God of, I want to say, even reclamation. And I think that's what we're told about restoring years that the swarming locust has eaten and the consuming locust has eaten. You know, Terry and I just uh, rounded. We're headed for 50 years of marriage before too much longer, three years away. And that's God. That's God. There's, there's nothing else I can say to you that, you know, we did this, we followed it. No, it's God. Yeah. He healed. He restored. And he can do that for you today. So don't let this Easter Sunday get by. I know some of you are probably visiting. And, um, you know, I'm sorry if you didn't get a happy, clappy Easter bunny uh, egg message. But that's not what Easter's all about. Easter's about making dead people alive. That's what Easter's about. So whether you need him and to meet him for the first time or come back to him, I highly suggest you do that today. Bow your heads with me, please. And Father, we are so grateful for your word, and we thank you that uh, we have that prophetic word confirmed because so much has been fulfilled. We know there's more to come, and we know just like everything in the past, a myriad of fulfilled prophecies, we know the balance is going to come true as well. You were in the tomb for three days. You did rise from the dead and are alive forevermore, seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. And for that, we're grateful today. And we thank you that there was a reason for all this. It wasn't just so we'd have a, a day to commemorate, but it's about setting souls free and ripping them from the grip of Satan and taking deadness and replacing it with new life in Christ. And so we're thankful for what Easter, Resurrection Sunday means yet even today. And friend, if you're here today and you haven't been born again and you don't know that your sin has been forgiven, I highly recommend that you take care of that today simply by coming into agreement with God that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And listen, the, the manifestation of your sin is irrelevant. The number of your sins is irrelevant because the atoning power of the blood of Jesus cannot be limited by number or circumstance. You can be a big sinner, a little sinner, a grievous sinner, a heinous sinner. It doesn't matter. If you confess that you are a sinner, he, being the faithful and just one, will forgive you. And if you need that forgiveness today, if you need to know that at the end of your days that your eternity will be spent in heaven, you need to come into that agreement with the Lord and make that confession or concede that you are that, and that's the holy and just one to save your perishing soul and begin to live for him from this day forward. If that's you here today, I'm just going to ask you to do something real simple. And it's simply an acknowledgement of what has already happened in your heart. And that is just lift your hand and say, Lord, by that, say, Lord, save me. Lord, I see your plan and purposes for my life. I've heard the truth from your word. Now I ask you to save me. And anybody here today that needs that salvation, just lift your hand before we go. I'm not going to ask you to stand or do anything else. I'm just going to ask uh, that you do that. God bless you. And anybody else today, don't let this moment get by. Don't, don't just slip into church on Easter Sunday and then go your way. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. Anybody need to come home today? Anybody else like the prodigal been dragging their dad's name through the mud? Well, his arms are open. He's ready to welcome you back as well. And uh, the, the parable talks about putting a ring on his finger and a robe on his back. And this was a, actually an adoption ceremony in Roman culture. He was publicly identifying that son as his own, even though he'd done all the things he had done. And let me tell you, as a former prodigal, that's one of the most wonderful feelings that you can ever experience, knowing that your dad still calls you his son or daughter. So if you're a prodigal today and you want to come home, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. Say, yeah, I, things are not good where I'm at. I want to come back to the Father's house. 
And if there's anybody there that wants to make, out there that wants to make that confession and concede their need for the Lord, I can ask you to do the same thing. Just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. God bless you and you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you on the back. And Father, we are so thankful for the right to come home. We're thankful that your word does not return void. And we thank you that you have rescued from uh, those who've been drawn towards death. And we thank you that you're welcome prodigals home. And Lord, we want to give you the glory. We want to give you the high praise and honor for what you have done here today. And so we thank you for these, Lord, who have had a work done in their hearts and they see the reality of life in the kingdom to be that which is worth pursuing. So we thank you for saving some and, and welcoming others home. And we give you glory and honor. And we thank you that your son, our savior, is risen and alive forevermore. We pray these things and give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, for those who raise their hand today, I just want to encourage you. You know, there, there's a lot of things that get said about Christians. And, you know, I like one of the descriptions of the early church. And even the Jews, they were called the people of the book. And you need the book, and you need to read the book. And this is the book you need to read. And you'll find uh, just questions, and you'll find answers. And uh, we're here at the church to, to answer any of the questions you may have. But, you know, I would suggest that all of you just start the day with just a simple request. Lord, lead me into your plan of purposes for my life. And uh, help me to lay aside the things that were hampering me and slowing me down. And, you know, I, I tell you one thing I know for sure. He's going to say yes to that prayer. Because the weights and sins that so easily beset us, the snares the devil tries to throw in front of us, are all handled by the power of the Holy Spirit promised to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. So just walk in the Spirit. The Bible says walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's not overly complicated, right? Hello? No, it's not. So, but you'll find out what the Spirit's will is for you by reading the book he wrote. Because all scripture is given by inspiration, divinely breathed uh, of God himself. So we celebrate your birthday or your homecoming today whichever it was and we rejoice in the lord always and again i say rejoice, rejoice.